I'm going to the flip chart. The camera's on me. Um, all right, so quick and paths. And basically, one of the things we do in the design meeting is we basically lay out a path. And we arbitrarily say, well, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we take these knowledge and skills from our analyses and we put them on little pieces of paper. This is kind of our control methodology in our process. And we cluster these knowledge and skills and we, we create a module and we, and we make a sense that, okay, there's, vol there's no, no volatile and non-volatile. We've got that cleaned up. We kind of understand other target audiences and so we basically got this where we think this is good. It'll support a lot of different people's needs. We don't have extraneous stuff in it that now make it inappropriate for another group. So if we've got this module now, where do we replace it? This is the kind of training content that people need, what, at the beginning of the training cycle, the middle, or the end? And they tell us. And let's just say that oh, that one went there, and we get another one here, and another one here, and another one here. And basically, we go through this process of taking all those knowledge and skill items, clustering them together into modules, putting them a module spec sheet on top of it, giving it a title and a number and all that, because you can tell by the content type what number it will have in the five tier thing. So you can at least give it the first tier number. So we basically go through this process of doing that, and we decide, we get into this and say, okay, now that we created this one, well, this one's wrong now. So we have to divide that one into two, and now this part goes down here, and you just, it's very iterative, messy, tedious. If you don't like this kind of stuff, stay away from it. Process. <clears throat> and we basically get all this stuff together. And we got all the modules, all the sub-assemblies of training, with some understanding of, for the typical target audience member who we've described previously, the worst case scenario, typically for me, is that at the beginning, this kind of training stuff should be on their plate in the middle of their training cycle, and this might be, and we might even be able to say, okay, this is immediate survival skills, first 30 days, ideally before they even took the job, but that never happens. The middle is the next year, and this is the le the, for the rest of their lives. And maybe we just, maybe when we're done here, we say, there's that first phase, this breaks out in a couple phases, that breaks out in the more, and we may end up with the seven phase thing. That can happen too. So our goal here is now to start taking these modules on this path for job A and decide how do we cluster the modules in the training events. So we're clustering. We went from, we were modulizing before, and now we're eventizing. So we might say, well, that makes sense. We'll package that all into one deliverable. That's an event now. You sign up for an event. You roll, uh, register at an event. You schedule events, if it's a schedulable type of thing, if it's not on demand and we administrate at the event level. We understand our training at the modular level, we are the training manufacturing folks, but we administrate it and our customers buy it bundled into events. We just understand modularity so we can be more effective and efficient with resources, uh, be more timely in our response to updating things. And so we may have a module that's an event all by itself and stuff like that, and that, so that's the drill. And the design team members from the real world, you know, those engineers or whoever we're dealing with are sitting there critiquing everything you do, asking you to rationalize it. Why are you doing that, guy? It's a training thing. Leave me alone. <laughs> yes? On those uh, training events, do, do they cut across the tiers that you were talking about? Yes, these modules, for example, this might have been module one. Welcome to Eli Lilly. Here's our history. The history here's where the history comes into place because history is important sometimes for us to understand. When I went to Motorola and they told us about the history, the, the radio's taking bullets and they still work in World War II and that's why they sold so many when the GIs came back and all that stuff, oh, I was pumped. And so I could have a, a, a tier, I might have several ones and twos in there. That could have been a three, that could have been my time management because time is important around here, I manage it well. Um, so I can have all these different module tiers. That's just, an, that's just an arbitrary sorting device. That's like taking your car apart and deciding, okay, let's figure out what the electrical parts are and the fuel parts are in the, wind, the glass versus the metal. You know, that's how you would recognize it if it was all in piece parts and sorted appropriately, but it wouldn't look like the product. This basically just allows us to look at the product and understand the component nature of the product. Again, we're dealing with something that's inherently complex. I apologize, this is inherently complex, but I think appropriately so. Implementation planning. All right, now that we've identified all the training that could be, could be 
we should be telling people all along, just because we can figure out what could be doesn't mean it should be, okay? That's the drill here. We're not trying to build an empire by calling out all this training, we're gonna build all of it. I always tell everybody from day one, if we start building more than 60% of the curriculum, something is probably wrong. I made up the 60%, you figure out your own number. Um, but basically, we should probably be buying laptops for every Salesforce member before we get into that part of this thing, or we should do something else with the money here. That can't be right. There is low priority stuff that we can identify that our knowledge and skills that are required to do the job, but if you develop training for them, the return will be negative and you don't want to do that. So we need to prioritize training modules and or events, because if you do the events, the module priorities pull forward. It depends on which your customer here, what level of this they want to be mucking around in. Establish budgets and personal resource requirements. If you know that you have group-paced classroom training or lab or CBT or self-paced or video-based, and you know historically what your developmental costs are, so you can ratio that. If I build eight hours of this or 40 minutes, uh, an hour of that, I know what that's gonna cost me approximately. I can do resource planning based on this curriculum architecture design. Once I have the priorities, I can tell you what the resource implications are. Now, of course, your customers might say, well, no, you know, we really want the 10 pound thing for the five pound price. The 10 pound training course shoved in a five pound bag, which means we cover everything about halfway. Um, but here's where you get a chance to basically get way up front of this thing and say, no, it just costs this much to do this. Now, we can do some really garbage training for you cheaper, <laughs> um, but it's, that's a business decision, and if that's what you want to direct us to do, we're not happy with it, but we'll do it. <clears throat> Determine support system requirements. There may, you may not have the infrastructure in place to de deploy all this stuff, which means you maybe shouldn't have designed it to be deployed in a manner that's inconducive with your <laughs> environment. And you can develop an implementation plan and assign responsibilities now. You can really get down to, and you can go to various levels on this. You can go beyond development. You get into delivery. You can get into the whole administrative thing and design everything around this. This is one input to what we call strategic planning for training and development, which is what Ray's book was, was all about. And I got a slide coming up on that in a few minutes. Basically, I, I, earlier I said that I'd like the steering team to set the priorities. I want them to own this. I want them to prioritize it. I want them to look at the dollars. I want them to say, if we go to priority number 1,000, what's it cost us? There's the line. Is that more or less than you were expecting? It's a business decision. Resource it more. If we're not getting down the priority list far enough for you, then you're going to have to put more money to it. It's like building factories. You need more, more space. You've got to put money to it. You just can't pretend that you will make that happen. We'll find the room in there someplace, maybe up on the roof. But you want to review this CAD with the steering team or the implementation planning team if they've created one to handle this for them on their behalf. Because if you really got to where, normally in some of these things, the, the number of modules you're looking at and prioritizing may be 100, 200. But I've been in meetings before where we're dealing with 1,200. And the steering team members are a high enough level that I didn't even pretend to ask them. I said, you will want to appoint a steering, uh, an implementation planning team to do this for you. Better get somebody from the CFO organization on here so they can understand the money implications that are coming out, where these numbers come from, so that they have some buy-in that this isn't just phony baloney numbers that the training people cooked up, or their customers. So you gotta have your assumptions. What's the cost to develop all the training? What are the planning scenarios? And just crunch the numbers and run several what-ifs and let the, let the steering team, those stakeholders, those customer stakeholders and other stakeholders, make some business decisions about what training should be brought to market to support the needs of the business.